Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is C. Paul Singh, President Nispel. A very good evening, and thank you all for joining us at the 129 edition of a webinar on citizens as eyes and ears against prevailing corruption in the society. I extend warm welcome to both our eminent speakers and other guests. And I'm sure that the delegates who have come to join us shall benefit and enjoy the deliberations. As a president of Nismat, let me say a few words about Nismat itself. Nismat was established in the year 1990 and started as a training institution in the field of private security, safety, management of light technology. With the passage of time, we started conducted courses for the ex-defense personnel for their second career in the private security industry. We also had the privilege of conducting courses at tandem with the Jawaharlal Nehru University on firefighting. In the recent past, Nisbet decided to become the foremost corporate training institution and a think tank organization in the field of security, safety, and applied technology. It has established four wings. Nisbet Forum to organize webinars, seminars, conferences, interactive programs, debates, and declamations. We have the Nisbet Academy and Nisbet Education to conduct virtual training programs. Then there's a Nisbet Enterprise. We intend to undertake audits and verifications all over the globe by establishing alliances and partnership. The ultimate is our, we want to establish it very soon, that is Nisbet Foundation, to undertake welfare and social work for the society at large, with particular reference to security and safety of the citizens. With the, Having said a few words about Nishpat, let me introduce the chairman, Captain Paman Aluwalia, the chairman of Nishpat. He took a voluntary retirement from the parachute regiment at a very young age, and he jumped into a business career. A very warm person very affectionate, and he has the knowledge of his subject very well. Whatever he deals with, he has the knowledge of that. He tries to get into details of the subject. A person of impeccable manners, a very thoughtful and inspiring leader. He has created a business group known as Aluwalia Holding, which has offices at multiple locations in India and abroad. He has that continuous perseverance and risk-taking attitude, and at times learning from pitfalls. This has helped him to grow and evolve himself into a position of prominence in the business world. He's the past president and a former chairman of Council of International Investigators, USA. And he's a body of Malcolm Thompson International Investigation. Shri Pawanji Tehluwalia 
shall moderate the session. Introducing the subject. Today's subject, as somebody writes in the initial stages when we're having an informal uh, chat, somebody says, very interesting subject. Indeed, it is a very interesting subject. The role of citizen in fighting corruption is indeed very important in view of rampant corruption prevailing in the society at large. The participation of citizens can provide an opportunity to the citizens also to influence the and help the anti-corruption enforcement agencies in the state. However, the participation of the citizens has to be very dynamic as corruption often bypasses and circumvents the laws and rules and it needs a lot of dynamism to keep it under check. Adverse effect of corruption is well known to all. One of the most important is there is a very, very disproportionate impact, particularly on the poor and most vulnerable sections of our society. It erodes the trust of the people in the government and it leads in creating a sort of fragile society where violence and conflict can happen every now and then. We know various forms of corruption like red tape, misbehavior of the officers, squeezing the poor for personal benefits and asking for gratification to perform routine duties, which is their duty as such and to award contract to favor friends, to give recognition and awards to the undeserving, and also have their own best interest wherever they give award. Eyes and ears of the citizens who watch all these forms of corruption are very important. All of us belonging to any class who do not expose corruption when it comes to our knowledge, are, I feel, I feel, a part of the corruption and should be made accountable for facilitating corruption in turn. If we pay attention to this, a lot of evidence can get generated through citizens to curb corruption or at least deal with corruption. We can also create citizen-friendly forums, citizen-friendly platforms to get this information. The eyes and ears of the citizen can no doubt plug the weak points in the system. Fighting corruption needs not only a proactive approach, it also needs stringent reactive measures. When allegations of fraud when allegations of corruption are substantiated, there should be no compromise at all to award stringent punishment to the guilty. The major areas of corruption include public procurement, loopholes in the state-owned enterprises, weak administration, and unequal delivery systems. The participation of citizens as such, through social media can be very important. Citizens can perhaps have their stories in anonymously on some social media platforms, like I also paid bribe, yeah, actual payment of bribe, etc. This documented material would help in dissemination of information to the government agencies to deal with corruption. Active participation of individuals and groups of the civil society and community can raise public awareness. I am of the view that some incentives probably can be provided to the people who give such information so that we get much more information. A brief People power program can be initiated in every society. Plug loopholes, which 
undermines the democracy and rule of law. It would, I would like to submit that grassroots movements against corruption can create political will and probably push the government to adopt policies. With these words, I pass on the session to the moderator, Captain Robert Aluvalia. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Sipal Singh. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, participants today from the following countries. We have participants from India, Spain, <coughs> Nigeria, Pakistan, Senegal, Singapore, Uganda, UK, USA, Zambia, New Zealand, and Lagos. Uh, we are at this point of time streaming live on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the sponsors for the event today, which is Tag Scores, which is an assessments platform, India Skills Private Limited, which is an assessment uh, organization, Premier Consulting and Investigations, uh, which does pre employment screening and general investigations. Uh, Premier Shield Private Limited, which is a manpower security company, and JMD Cargo, <coughs> uh, which uh, assists uh, people in sending cargo overseas. Uh, a word to all the participants today. Uh, please uh, try and have your video on during the uh, webinar. It's nice to see your faces. Uh, please have your cell phones switched off so that there are no side distractions. And please prepare to ask questions and put them in your chat so that uh, I can ask you when the time comes. A word about our president. Mr. Sipal Singh is a master's in English literature and he served the government of India and senior police assignments across the country. He raised the uh, Rapid Action Force in India and was its first chief. He later raised uh, and headed the Internal Security Academy, a central police academy at Mount Abu in the state of Rajasthan in India. Uh, during his uh, service, uh, he has been decorated with several medals of distinguished for distinguished services by the president of the country and various organizations. He's also got a Sena medal which speaks volumes for his uh, work with the armed forces. Post-retirement, he's worked as a consultant with Tata Iron and Steel Company, where he uh, streamlined the security and vigilance of their cold field divisions. He was the chairman of the technical committee of quality control of India, which formulated the standards for star rating of private security companies. He was involved in developing the curriculum for private security guards training under the Security Sector Skill and Development Council. He was the head of the committee which designed and worked out national occupation standards for the training of private security guards and qualification pact and national occupation standards for the firefighters. Post-retirement in 2009, the President of India recognized his services as the security personality of the year. He serves as the advisor to the Asian Professional Security Association, the Indian chapter, and is the honorary director general to the Central Association of Private Security Industry in India. Mr. Sipal's face is well known in India as a dynamic security professional, and he's frequently called upon to share his views on various subjects connected to homeland security on national news channels. I now have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce Mr. Colonel Singh. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that this is the uh, that this is one of the best CVs that I have sort of uh, 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 read out now uh, in the last two years. Mr. Colonel Singh is a officer from the Indian Police Service. He is an electrical engineer, 
a post graduate in computer science from iit kharagpur an mba with specialization in finance a law graduate from the silgaonkar law college in goa and a diploma in information technology from pune while in service his services were recognized by the president of india in the year 2002 and 2008 He has been a sportsman of an exceptional caliber, having been awarded as the best sports person and athlete while in college and the police athletic events. He is the author of a book titled "Batla House," based on true facts, as he was involved with the encounter that took place in New Delhi in 2008 in Batla House. He supervised money laundering cases. for vijay malya and nirav modi in 1996 and 97 there were a series of blasts 42 in all that rocked delhi he investigated the cases that led to 22 modules of lashkar e toiba being arrested from all over the country in 2005 he investigated the bomb blast in liberty and satyam cinemas of delhi the investigation led to several babar khalsa terrorists being arrested again in 2005 there were three blasts in delhi one in sroji nagar pahadganj and gobindpuri 67 persons died 200 got injured the case uh, he cracked the case within 7 days which led to the arrest of several let operatives He investigated the Upahar tragedy where 59 persons had lost their lives. He arrested Ramesh Sharma, an operator of Dawood, and Abu Salim in New Delhi. He burst the Babu Silivaswa gang. Under his watch, several arrests of dreaded criminals has taken place. He aided the computerization of Delhi police and computerized recruitment of constables. introduced non clonable id cards established cyber labs in delhi for delhi police and connected the enforcement directorate with cyber labs across india ladies and gentlemen i present to you mr kadal sir thank you very much uh, shri dushyant dave ji leading top advocate of the country shri c pal singh ji president ismat team nismat captain avanjit aluwalia chairman nismat and the participants first of all i must thank shri c pal singh ji my senior who has invited me to talk on this uh, I, i was telling him that this is a very unique topic fighting uh, fighting against corruption in the country citizens as eyes and ears i have not seen this topic previous to this sir i remember around 3 years ago i had visited aims alindia institute of medical sciences in delhi and that that is imprinted on my on my mind i saw the patients waiting patients queues and their relatives waiting and sitting on the road side i felt very bad in the sense that we are not able to provide the proper place for the patients to sit even in the aims what could be the reason is it corruption is it mismanagement so i, I remember in 1993 when i was working in the district the north west district one senior person he used to visit me he was around 75 years of age and i am talking of 1993 he would say there are four types of corruption one is nazarana he says in the past what used to happen is the person will go to the senior officers place give him some gift without any work in the hope that no injustice would be done to him and that was called nazarana he says then what started is you do some help to somebody it may be totally legal help he comes to your house with a sweet or with a bouquet that is called shukrana 
you know, after some time, the officers started demanding money, saying that for doing your work, we have to do very hard work, as if government is not paid to them. And he said, this is mehantana. I am working for you, you please pay for it. <coughs> and he says, now to, it has started jabarana. If you don't give the money, I will not do your work. And from 93 now, Lord Water has flown. I have seen in the Commonwealth Games, where I was asked uh, by the then Home Minister to go to the Commonwealth Office and take some files and find out what is happening. There is a shlok in Gita, Adhyaya 3, shlok 12. I'll just say that. Ishtan bhogan hi ho devaha dasyante yag bhavitaha. And the meaning is when we do yag or when we do our karma, when we do something for the society or something for the other people, we get results of that. That is bhog. Second line of it says, Tahi dattan apradaya ebhya ya sustain as he says once we get something from the society if we do not give it back <coughs> he's talking of deva but i am converting into the society if we do not give it back to the society he says such people are thieves this i read long back and i what i understood with this is if we take away right of somebody if if we do not give right to somebody which belongs to him, we are basically corrupt. So corruption for me is not only taking money for the work. Corruption for me is for not doing my duty for the other people. And that is very, very important in life because if I am not giving promotion, in timely promotion to somebody, I am corrupt. Now, the, there, is, there is a huge impact of corruption. I'll just briefly touch upon that. One is the development issues. We were investigating National Rural Health Mission case of Uttar Pradesh. The 80% of the funds given, to, given by the government to the state for purchasing the equipments of the hospitals, for providing facilities in the hospitals, were eaten away by the minister, the bureaucrats, and the doctors. And certainly the people, poor people who go to the hospital, they were not getting the facilities. I'll give you a very interesting case of this fertilizer subsidy. Uh, in enforcement directed, this file came to me for closure, but then I examined it. I said before closing it, I should examine. So what I found, found is very interesting. The government of India imports the fertilizer through the private agencies like IFCO and others. Now the person in IFCO through his son opened one office in Dubai. Now what happens is that India is trying to procure it and they, they float the tender for procurement. The rates goes high internationally. But by that time his son's fact, the companies in Dubai would already purchase at a cheaper rate and then sell at a higher cost rate to the country. I examined that if, if something is costing around 40 rupees in a normal time, when the India issue standard, it will cost around 80 rupees. 50% was the subsidy. So I calculated the farmers, farmers are not getting any subsidy. The whole subsidy is going to these fertilizer companies. So I, I decided to investigate that case. That case is under investigation even now. I don't know what is happening. But the question is, what is happening? We are saying we are giving so much subsidy to the farmers, but actually it is not reaching to them. And then we take example, bad money drives out good money. There is a concept. Now, anybody who is a bad money, when he is doing anything, suppose he is doing a business, his interest basically is to hide that money, hide the origin of that money. And a person who is doing business, 
with his own money the white money he wants profit in that now in that competition in the market certainly the who will survive the person with the black money person with the white money is going to fail in the market even take example of disinvestment of public sectors who who can say that I, i'll pay the most the person with the black money real estate prices they go i i have a plot in mohali i wanted to sell it two years ago the people who wanted to purchase they wanted to give me 40% as a cash i i did not sell it even my batchmates told me this is a procedure in the real estate it it is a black money part comes it is still not being sold till today because of i said i refuse to take the black money in that then what happens to the the taxes are to be paid the people who are not earning the black money they are not paying taxes and the government needs funds government needs revenue so this tax liability shift to the the, the law abiding citizens they have to pay more taxes beyond that now the people who have black money who have corrupt money they have started penetrating into the upper world they will contest elections they will come to the parliament they will formulate laws for whose benefit they will formulate laws that we have to understand then i will go further corruptive penetration of anti corruption agencies if the agencies which had to take care which had to catch the corrupt people the themselves become corrupt what will happen to this briefly i have touched upon the impact of corruption but this eyes and ears scheme which is proposed actually caught my eyes the reason being in delhi police we had eyes and ears scheme for collecting intelligence and this scheme had us particularly when the blast took place on 13 september 2008 in delhi three bombs were detected through the ears and i is a ears and eyes scheme of the public in which and they were diffused so this scheme is an excellent scheme can we have parallel to containing the corruption we have seen anna ek hazare agitation and we have seen ultimately nothing has happened i know mr dushan dave i have been following him when he speak in the supreme court particularly on corruption on on some judges he he will be speaking he knows better than what is happening in the country the question is how to implement this system the first issue i feel is about the implementation stage whom to report that is one could we have one agency which can keep people names anonymous after getting evidences from them today you give information in any of the agencies his name is known to the to the people against whom he has made complaint we we have totally porous agencies and names of the people who would be coming forward is not concealed i remember a case in delhi one doctor being acted as a whistle blower and he lodged a complaint against supply of medicines in delhi a fire was registered in the anti corruption branch of delhi police but after some days interestingly a team of one anti corruption agency i'll not name them that came to the hospital and the accused of the other case was with the team this doctor was very popular so he was standing outside with the patients relatives so this accused went there and started beating the doctor saying he is the he is the person now 
immediately somebody mail, made a call at 100 number. So the, the, that anti-corruption agency had come with some money to be put on that person. But because there were other people, there were police had come also. So what they wrote in the FIL was very interesting. They wrote that this person took the, the bribe giver on the truck side. Therefore, witnesses could not see that any money was paid. And this man with the money that vanished. They registered the case, searched his house. The thing was found in his house also. The court immediately gave bail to him. On these facts, when court came to know, I spoke to one of the senior person in that agency when they took the remand. And I told that, please try to see that the money is not implanted on him because actually he has not taken any money. Ultimately, this person was acquitted, basically discharged from the court. But what happened to him? His whole life changed because he lost a complaint. So how do we protect the witnesses? How do we protect the people who are making complaint? We, we have an order from the Supreme Court, which talks of Supreme Court guidelines, actually, which says the, the, for the witness protection that in each district, there will be a committee. But I have not seen any committee in any of the districts. The Supreme Court guidelines have been issued. Sorry, Jagjit Singh, please uh, mute yourself. Supreme Court has issued guidelines, but not, not being implemented. Toothless guidelines, I, I, I would say. Then this leads to fear of backlash. We do not have any, any law at the moment to protect the whistleblower, to protect the witnesses. I, I feel the proposition is an excellent one. If the people can come forward and can give information about what is happening in the society, the corrective measures can be taken, but implementation issues are there. The fear of backlash issues are there. How to handle them? We have to find a solution in that direction. With this, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and now uh, I have a distinct pleasure and honor to introduce my friend, Mr. Dushant Dave. Dushant is a senior advocate and has been practicing law for over four decades. He was a member of the National Legal Services Authority during 2004 to 2008. He has served on the board of leading international arbitration associations and has been the president of the Supreme Court Bar Association for three terms. He regularly defends the public causes both inside and outside the courts and contributes regularly to op-eds in leading newspapers and magazines on national legal and constitutional issues. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Dushant Dave. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Mr. Karnel Singh. Uh, President, Mr. Sipal Singh, Mr. Pawan Aluwalia, distinguished uh, friends who, are, who have joined the program to participate, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be here. But I must say, it, I, the subject that we have chosen, you know, is so difficult to even deal with that it gives me, I would say, a, a extreme sense of disappointment in even dealing with it. Corruption is an international phenomenon. It's not confined to India. And so long as human being is, are there, corruption is bound to be there. I mean, corruption is not a new phenomenon. It's there for centuries, you know, every, 
for thousands of years, corruption has been in society. A country like India, with a population of 1.3 billion, with limited resources, with abject poverty amongst a very sizable section of society, I think has to face corruption in a very, very different way and must have zero tolerance towards it. Sadly, corruption is treated is on a very, very low priority when it comes to you know, the executive uh, and the police in the country. Citizens perhaps would be the last group of people who can really take uh, a kind of a crusade against corruption because there is an atmosphere of fear in the country. And unless and until you can remove that atmosphere of fear, it is going to be well nigh impossible for citizens to really come to uh, you know, uh, fight corruption openly. You have to ensure that as Mr. Colonel Singh with his vast experience and his uh, you know, outstanding career has himself said that it is very difficult to protect those who are you know, willing to come forward and file complaints or those who are willing to give evidence because there is no way one can protect them. Our law is, you know, I, I would say singularly uh, incompetent to protect uh, either the whistleblowers or the complainants in given cases. So they suffer in many ways. I, my feeling is that, and it's too general, I think all of you know, you have vast experience. Each one of you deals with, uh, you know, lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Each one of us sees our experiences with our families, with our friends, with our neighbors. Uh, it's really something unbelievable what has happened to this country. And I'm sure it is ha it's happening in other countries as well. Take, for example, people who are in public life, from a serpent to a minister. You see them, you see their lifestyles, you see the lifestyles of their families. They are all leading lifestyles which are beyond known sources of income. During their uh, you know, office or even post you know, retirement from their offices. Nobody can say anything about it. Nobody can question about it. Everybody assumes that you know, they have some sources of income, but they have none. Most of these people who come in public life, uh, at least in elected offices, are, are most of them, I would say, or a substantial majority of them are professional politicians. They are not people who are successful in any walk of life uh, being uh, either being a successful lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or a chartered accountant or a businessman or in any or a successful farmer who comes forward to you know really work in public life. These are hardcore professional politicians who from the word go from their college days decide to plunge into politics and they go on to you know, hold various offices and suddenly you find that their families are living lives of kings. Their children are moving around in you know, Mercedes cars or BMW cars. They have you know, fancy homes. They have all kinds of investments in properties all over. Their marriages are spent with crores and crores of rupees. But we can't do a damn thing about it. We all shut our eyes to it. Same thing is with you know, those bureaucrats, the police officers, many judges. In almost every walk of life you see today that people are openly leading lives beyond their known sources of income. As Mr. Colonel Singh says, that they don't pay their taxes and the burden falls on those who are you know, willing to pay taxes honestly. I'll tell you in legal profession, there is a substantial number of lawyers who are not paying their taxes uh, as they should be paying. So it, it's something which is really, I mean, part of our now DNA, part of our uh, you know, blood, we are not able to really get out of it. Now, what do we, what can citizen do in a situation like this? He knows that when he has anything to, you know, uh, to be done in the government, it is, I mean, it's not that it is impossible. 
There are people, I mean, I have come across a large number of people. I have in 42 years, I have never had to pay a penny to anyone, be it my income taxes or my other, you know, permissions that I may have sought for my homes or for my uh, other, you know, investments or anything. But that's because people also know that if you are dealing with somebody who is himself leading an honest life, they would think 50 times before making a demand on you of, you know, some kind of a favor. So it's something which is, I would say, reciprocal. But otherwise, people are now finding it extraordinarily difficult to get anything done from government offices. And government today is omnipresent in our lives. There is nothing we can do without government help. We can't virtually even breathe without government help. So, you know, it is something where what is the solution is where the law is there. Take, for example, whom do they, you know, charge under Prevention of Corruption Act? A conductor, a police constable? Have you ever seen a top police officer, top bureaucrat, or a top judge, or a top minister being ever charged under corruption? It happens rarely. And whenever it happens, it happens because of political vendetta. It only happens out of political vendetta, not because we want to really fight corruption. So the difficulty is that the existing laws are there. The, the willingness, the will to take action against anybody is... I mean, I ask a question, why should you fasten responsibility on me as a citizen to talk about, to bring to the notice of the police authorities or anti-corruption authorities or Lokayukt lo as to who is corrupt and what is uh, happening in a particular department. Are they not aware? Is there no accountability within the government, within the judiciary, within bureaucracy, within the police department where they, they can see what is happening within their systems? <coughs> they know what's happening. But nobody is willing to take any action or initiative. Everybody turns a blind eye to it. Everybody turns a blind eye to it. And that's really the saddest commentary because, I mean, citizens would be very difficult for them to become ears and eyes because citizens are, I would say, defenseless. They are helpless. They don't want to go through you know, the kind of harassment which can be unleashed on them by these corrupt people who have, you know, lots of access to all kinds of, you know, illegalities which they can, you know, launch against these innocent citizens who might dare to complain against them. So it is very, I personally feel that, yes, we may talk about citizens being eyes and ears. Uh, citizens may perhaps even have a duty as uh, Mr. Colonel Singh says, that we should have a duty. But how many of us can really, you know, discharge that duty? It's, it's, it's extremely funny as to what is happening. I remember I once, uh, you know, uh, long back, some 30 years ago, uh, 35 years ago in Ahmedabad, uh, there was a, a person who was uh, lying on the road. Somebody, it was a hit and run case. I took him to the hospital and we could save his life. And uh, the police named me as a witness in that. And the judges uh, insisted I go and give evidence. So, you know, I mean, luckily, I, you know, I, I wrote to the judge and said that this is what it is. Police has wrongly named me as a witness. I was not a witness. He was lying on the road. And then the judge understood. But because I was a lawyer, the judge, out of sheer respect for me, decided, you know, to drop that uh, summons against me. Otherwise, a non-bailable warrant would have been issued against me. So I am give a feeling that it is, it's not really to my mind. I mean, I don't mean any disrespect. And since we have many foreign friends who are on this program, but to my mind, we have lost the battle to fight corruption in this country long ago. And I don't think we can ever, you know, now initiate that battle. There is no, there is no, I think people have come to, I would say, compromise with corruption. People have come to now uh, feel that it's all right. I mean, it's part of, uh, you know, uh, businessmen feels that 
uh, part of my earnings i must uh, spend in uh, you know facilitating easy uh, favors or easy decisions or easy approvals or to even avoid uh, unnecessary visits by inspector to my factories or my offices so this has become part and parcel of everybody's you know i would say uh, this attitude uh, uh, because people are not willing to really stand up and i don't blame people for that i don't blame because if supposing you file a complaint and you go to a court the court will be hearing that case for 10 years the complainant will be required to go to court some 200 times now does he have time to do that why should he be subjected to that kind of treatment the system every system to my mind has failed right from the word police when he goes to police to file a complaint first police will discourage him from filing the complaint they will ask him what is your motivation instead of trying to catch the culprit the corrupt man they will ask the complainant what is your motivation in coming here and they will dis dissuade him they will discourage him from filing the complaint in the first instance ultimately if they are forced to uh, register the complaint then this you know innocent citizens flight starts then court then all kinds of problems and ultimately you know the the burden of proof in corruption cases although it's very simple but it is made so complicated by judicial structure that more often than not these cases you know take such a long time that the proof ultimately the evidence disappears somehow it disappears it's very very difficult you know to uh, 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 do anything i'll give you one simple example i was a special prosecutor for government of karnataka to prosecute late chief minister of tamil nadu jailalitha and shashikala and uh, it was a open and shut case the uh, you know the trial court had acquitted on completely ridiculous uh, uh, you know grounds uh, the uh, 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 sorry the trial court had convicted and the high court released her on completely ridiculous grounds and it was a totally unsustainable judgment and i mean i argued the case i still remember before uh, bench of justice uh, pinaki ghosh who is now our great lokayukt and after becoming lokayukt years i don't see him having taken up a single case in last two years or three years his office was opened by prime minister modi in ashoka hotel with great fanfare but i don't think you have ever heard that lokayukt has done handled a single case in newspapers anyway i argued this uh, case before the bench presided by justice ghosh and somebody else i forget the name of the other judge and uh, uh, the judgment was reserved open and shut case open and shut case the judgment was not given for one year and when i uh, insisted uh, you know that judgment be given the judgment was delivered after ms jailalitha died and only shashikara because once the accused dies what can you do in a criminal matter so miss shashikala was found guilty and she was sent to jail whereas miss jailalitha during her lifetime never you know uh, faced that jail so this is the level at which the fight against corruption is you know taking place in this country and this is the highest court of the country the supreme court of india if supreme court has no interest in deciding such a matter within one week or two weeks then what to talk about trial courts or the high courts so i feel that there is corruption is something which can be really fought by a group of determined you know extremely motivated determined you know officers in the police who are created as a special cell Uh, to really fight corruption of uh, finding such extremely honest and motivated you know group of officers today is well nigh uh, impossible uh, i mean uh, it's it's so difficult to find people who will have that kind of a, a track record and who will have that kind of a zeal but if you find such a cell then you must be in a position as mr colonel singh rightly says where people can file anonymously a complaint and the complaint should be investigated 
But then what will happen in this country of 1.3 billion people? People will be making, you know, completely bogus complaints from time to time. And these officers will therefore be completely flooded with many a times wrong complaints. So how do you then deal with it? So you also must have a mechanism that if somebody gives a false complaint, then he should be prosecuted. Now, have you heard of a single case where a citizen has been prosecuted for a false complaint in this country? I have not. The, uh, the IPC has provisions for such a you know, situation. But it doesn't happen. So my own take is that unless a concerted effort is made by the executive, the bureaucracy, the police, the judiciary, forget the politicians. The politicians have their own ways of uh, you know, uh, doing, looking at all these. But in this uh, group of people, I remember many years ago in Italy, the judges decided they and they took upon themselves that we must fight the mafia and we must finish them off. Many judges were attacked. Many judges were murdered. But this group of prosecutors and judges actually went about cleaning Italy from the clutches of the mafias in a remarkable way. It was a long fight for almost 10 years, but they did it. Now, that kind of determination has to come to a group of you know, uh, people in this country. They all have to sit together, they have to think together, they have to apply their mind together. Unless we do that, I don't think citizens can be, uh, you know, really the eyes and ears to fight corruption. I, I, I don't think, I don't expect my citizens really to be subjected to ill treatment by these rich and powerful people who are indulging in corruption openly in, on day in, day out basis. Openly. Now, even men like uh, Gogoi, who after his retirement has accepted a favor from the government to become a Rajya Sabha member in a, a television interview has said there is corruption in Supreme Court. So what was he doing as Chief Justice? What was he doing as Chief Justice? So it's all right for everybody, you know, all these people, nobody wants to take the responsibility. Nobody wants to really, you know, start the fight against corruption. Everybody wants to talk about it. Those who are in power, those who are in position to fight corruption. And I, I can tell you, I mean, uh, judiciary has many substantially overwhelming honest judges, but there are rotten apples in judiciary at every level and nothing happens to them. Nothing happens to them. I have seen judges also post retirement whose children have bought houses worth 200 crores of rupees. So, so it, nothing can be done about it. So I feel that, uh, uh, you know, uh, let us uh, together understand what this uh, country's problems are. Corruption needs to be fought. Uh, but as I said earlier, the battle to fight corruption in India is long lost. I, I don't think we can ever really uh, do a, any meaningful, you know, opposition to corruption in this country. Thank you so very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dijan, for your comments. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to sort of say, our President, Mr. Sipal Singh, has a summons uh, which came to him uh, a few days back, dating back to an authority letter that he'd given to someone in the year 2004. So 70, uh, how many, now 17 years after a particular letter was signed, given to somebody to do a particular job, uh, Mr. Sipal saying at the age of 85 is being summoned to uh, Delhi to give evidence on something that he doesn't even remember as to what he had uh, tasked the other person to do. So uh, this is just a comment that I have from your talk. Uh, uh, we have questions. Uh, Sanjay Ricky, can you please ask your question? Yeah, uh, very good evening and uh, thanks for the insights and the updates on uh, corruption. Uh, let me now share my view and a, a, a small, honest uh, question, full of determination, as uh, you parted with saying that, you know, we need the will to really curb corruption. Uh, as an individual, I would say it's difficult to give up on the fact to curb corruption. What overall changes can we propose now in all sections of the society after having taken a stock of uh, the present situation? Uh, that's one. 
And can we not uh, make a roadmap now as a common uh, citizen and fix up milestones so that we can systematically approach this and make it happen somehow to really become the eyes and ears uh, of, the, of the nation to really curb corruption? A very, very uh, humble question. Can we not really brainstorm and can we get some, I think, you know, experts, I think, you know, just giving us a guidance in terms of making a white paper for the government and really, really show the will to really implement it. I don't know what, I mean, Mr. Colonel Singh has a better experience than I have and better qualifications. But I feel sometimes, you know, countries like China, for example, they fight corruption in a ruthless way. Over the years, I used to see that China used to execute, you know, several hundred people on charges of corruption. And yet China has one of the highest levels of corruption today. I mean, although it's a communist country, and yet it has, you know, now breeding capitalism and China's political leadership, there are serious allegations against them. Now, if you want to really do something in India, I think the somewhat, I mean, I, and I may sound little uh, cynical uh, and uh, little, I would say, uh, I, a little perhaps improper, but if you really want to fight this, you have to set examples. Catch thousand people in this country. It's very easy to catch them. They are all there. You all see us. I mean, we see them every day. We know who are corrupt and who is not corrupt. We all know that. Catch those thousand people and bring them to justice. I'm not for a moment saying that we should execute anybody. I'm against death sentence in corruption cases. But at least bring them to justice. Seize their assets. Seize the assets of their families. Seize the assets of their friends. And see the kind of chilling message that you will send to society. Today, what is really happening is that there is no message being given to anyone. It is now become so rampant <coughs> that everybody knows that I can do whatever I want to do. I can make money whatever way I want to make. Nothing is going to happen to me. Whether I am a bureaucrat, I am a judge, I am a politician, I am a serpent, I am a police officer. Or even if I am a member of the anti-corruption squad. Not, so they all know that, or for example, industrialists. The kind of crony capitalism that India is seeing today is unparalleled. We are seeing how these people are suddenly becoming rich. There is a clear-cut click between these politicians, bureaucrats, and these business people. They are all scheming this country left, right, and center. They are scheming the valuable resources of the country and they are amassing wealth, which is mind blowing. We have these people with billions and billions and billions worth of you know, assets and monies, while uh, some 75, 80 crore people live below poverty line. We all know how it is happening. They are, they are getting you know, le mining leases by paying money. They are getting other contracts by paying money. You think we don't know that? We all know it. So unless we are willing to really pick out these thousand people to stay, set an example, we have to do something drastic. It might to somewhat extent become slightly, I mean, uh, taking the procedural law out of, you know, uh, uh, out of the wind. Because it's the procedural law which really keeps these people, you know, safe. We must forget these uh, procedural safeguards and we should try and bring them and, you know, and then once you send a message, uh, today there is no message at all. How do you fight crimes? You can fight crimes by ensuring that rule of law prevails in the country, by ensuring that people who are committing crimes are brought to justice. If you don't, you know, fight that, if you don't have a strong rule of law, which we don't have, I frankly feel that virtually there is no rule of law in this country. It's only for a common man. The rich and the powerful are above the law. So it, it's, it's something which is so difficult to really happen, so difficult to achieve. Well, nigh impossible, honestly. I've been a lawyer for 42 years and I can tell you it's not uh, not going to be possible. 
Mr. Kadel Singh, would you like to sort of uh, add something? So unmute yourself, please. Uh, to begin with, let me talk about what Mr. Dushan Tave told about Italy. See, what happened in, uh, it, 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 it is a talk of 70s to begin with. Southern Italy was not progressing. How much money was put into that, but it was not developing. It was because of mafia. Italy mafia working in Italy as well as in America. In the Italy, this is, there is a civil law system. So there are investigating judges also. So one of the judge issued the summons against mafia. He was killed. When he was killed, there was a public agitation. And after this public agitation, the parliament appointed a committee. Many of the parliamentarians were booked having connections with the mafia. One particular prosecuting, the investigating judge, he started investigation with, with his team, though he was being threatened. And instead of going through the criminal angle, he went into the money laundering angle. He coordinated with the US and ultimately they were able to find out evidences of money trade. There is a case known as Maxi trial in, in Italy. And there is a case of Pisa trial in, in US in that period. More than 200 mafiosos were prosecuted in Italy. They were convicted. But it requires a will. And I'll tell you, even that investigating judge was killed in 1992 by the mafia. You require a will of the government, ultimately. So public agitation is there, like we had public agitation in country when Anna agitation was going on. But what happened subsequently? Lokpal came. But what happened to Lokpal, as Mr. Dushan Dave is explaining what happened to that? Not even a single case coming in the in newspapers. Unless there's a will of the government, it will be difficult. Even if the public comes to comes forward, we have poor people in the country. For them, giving something in bribe will be better than going, going to make a complaint. Even I have seen businessmen, when, when I tell them, why don't you make a complaint? They say, if I make a complaint against the government servant, then I'll not get benefit from the government in any other case. My file will be stuck up. People are afraid. Can we give them promise that if they get, give complaint, they will be protected. They will be protected in their business. They will be protected in their day-to-day -day life. We are not able to give that unless, unless we can give them protection, legal protection. Things will be difficult. And for this, it requires a will. <coughs> it is lacking perhaps. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mohit Pandit, is he there? Abhijit Das, your question. Good evening, everyone. Uh, is my voice uh, audible yes, there? Very audible. No, uh, this is a very uh, pertinent uh, topic that you have chosen uh, for the for the evening as a discussion. So uh, after hearing Karnal Singh, I had just one uh, uh, one uh, thought in my mind, which I have actually mentioned in the chat as well. That something which intrigues me is that punishment, which is supposed to be the last mile tool to say infuse deterrence, is failing in its purpose. Uh, else, there would have been a visible change. And the other thing that I want to bring in is about people. So people are supposed to be the change makers who are supposed to actualize the actions post marking the accused of corruption. So are we short of the right-minded human capital to do the needful? So if we are actually short of the right-minded people, you know, emerging and coming into society, then how do we deal with this? So these are the points which I had in my mind when I was talking about corruption. And I'm speaking from the perspective of a, a very weak common man, something which uh, uh, our esteemed, uh, you know, panelist uh, uh, advocate Dushim Dave also hinted upon. So uh, I was a little scared of asking this question as well, but since we have uh, all a bunch of brave people over here, so I thought, let's ask this. 
See, the, the problem, problem lies in our short-sightedness. You see the elections. Whom are being elected? On what, what is the criteria for election? Caste? Favoritism? Are elections being fought in our country on development? On issues which we are facing? Unemployment, for example. And when we are giving votes on the basis of the religion, the caste, not on the basis of what is right in the country. So, whom we end up selecting? Electing for the parliament. So, how do we get the will? So, public has to unite, public has to get the will to cleanse the country. But that will is lacking. Thank you. I think, Mr. Pandit, the problem is more acute, uh, you know, if I have to answer your question. And the problem is more acute because we as citizens today are not able to get the kind of moral value system that we should possess either from our parents or from our teachers and certainly not from our leaders. We all see them. See, everybody looks at the success of these scoundrels. And therefore, everybody wants to, you know, <laughs> uh, imitate them. They see them going around and lead, leading lives of kings and emperors. So young minds are bound to be influenced by this. And therefore, everybody wants to make shortcuts in life. So the value system, unless you can install, you know, I, you have to, I, I must share with you. I have been very fortunate in having great parents. My father was a judge. But I do remember my father as a high court judge that by the 25th of every month, we had no money in the house. We had no money. My mother could not even think of buying milk for three or four days. And we did not have in those days, there was no government car. There was no money to buy petrol. And my father would walk to the high court or would go by auto. I remember me and my sister, when we had to use the telephone, in those days, some 150 calls were given free on landline. If we had to write each one of the calls that we would make, and 150 first phone call, he would make the payment to the high court from his pocket. Now, that's a level of value system that I have seen in my family. Today, you know, it's becoming very, very difficult to have the value system. That's one problem. The other is, Mr. Pandit, who is willing to make a sacrifice? Who is willing to make a <coughs> sacrifice? <coughs> I'll tell you, in legal profession today, top seniors like us are briefed by lawyers from across the country. Now, it is... And it has become extremely acute during pandemic that every briefing lawyer expects, you know, a certain percentage of fees out of your fees. People like us who are not willing to do it are today suffering. So what do you do about this? You are, you must be willing. I mean, take for example, income taxes. In 42 years, my return has never been even questioned, forget open. Because I have never taken fees in cash. Whatever comes in cash, people give it. It is reflected in my books of accounts, deposited and reflected in my income tax return and income tax is paid. I love money. I also love a jazzy life. I also would love to have a Lamborghini and drive around. But it's that commitment. Now that sacrifice, people are unfortunately not willing to. So you need a twin fold. You need value system in you. And you need willingness to make a sacrifice. Unless this too happens, Mr. Pandit, there is nothing that we can do about today's India. Our youth are really, are, they are our, our uh, asset. Our youth are our asset. But our youth, sadly, are being misguided by our leaders. Completely misguided. And our youth see what our leaders are doing. Leaders in every walk of life. Leaders in law leaders in medical profession, leaders in industry, leaders in politics. Everywhere you see leaders who have become successful by shortcuts. 
excellence is dying in this country and excellence is not even being rewarded so we are we are in a unique problem very very unique problem problem is nobody wants to talk about it nobody wants to discuss it and let me tell you one thing nobody will even utter a word about it so unless we talk about it unless we start discussing it openly i mean what then what is going to happen That's right. Uh, you know, at least Nismas made a start uh, with Mr. Sipal Singh having suggested this particular topic. Uh, let's have Mr. Kaushar Ahmed. Is he there, please? Your question. Kaushar Ahmed. I think he's not there. Uh, John Chinatra, your question, please. Unmute yourself, John, please. My question is very simple. Forgetting about the an individual's contribution to curbing corruption, how can, as a country, we control the banking system to prevent and curb big-time fraud and corruption? How much can the banking system be controlled? Because most of these uh, frauds happen through public sector banks. The private sector bank, the CEO is very careful in lending. So is there some space in uh, using it? I, I don't, you know, look at this country. It's a very funny country. You have electoral bonds, which is nothing but open corruption. 4,000 crores of rupees is the, you know, is the investment of Bharatiya Janata Party through electoral bonds. What is an electoral bond? It's a, nothing but a bribe. But that bribe, which is legally recognized and Supreme Court is not willing to hear the challenge to the electoral bonds. So uh, uh, banking, for example, you are very rightly asking a question I know of, and I'm sure each one of us knows, large number of people around us who have borrowed tens and hundreds of crores of rupees from banks, not paid them, and yet they are all leading lifestyle of emperors. They are all driving in their Mercedes Benzes. They all go to Europe for summer vacations. Their children are doing businesses in some other names. 20 lakh crore, almost 20 lakh crore is taken away from the banking system by these individuals. We are talking about one poor Malia, what about Mr. Rani Lambari, who has left a debt of 4 lakh crore? Does anybody speak about it? Why? Because of proximity to certain persons. You are damning my, Malia, who was willing to pay you 15,000 crores back. Because it's a symbol to, you know, uh, that we are fighting corruption. But you are not willing to catch Mr. Ambani, who has left a 4 lakh crore debt. I am appearing against him, for example, in a case in uh, Orissa for Orissa Electricity Grid, uh, Gridco. Four and a half thousand crores of rupees of overdrawn escrow account. I and for this. 15 years, they did not even recover from consumers 25% of the uh, dues. So you can imagine somebody was taking this money in cash. We are, we are, we are, it's very difficult. I don't think we have determination because these people are very well entrenched. They have, you know, connections everywhere from the top to the bottom. It's only in some, you know, cases that they will pick up Choksi and some Malia and some other poor fellow. I mean, I have no sympathy for them. It's not that I have any sympathy for Malias and Choksis. But Choksi, Amalia was allowed to leave this country by the very government. I had, I will tell you, share you now, it's, and it was reported in Economic Times. Three days before Malia left the country, this SBI sought my opinion, State Bank of India. And I said it was a Sunday. I was in, uh, uh, they came to meet me at seven o'clock in the evening with their uh, law, law firm, Dua and Associates. And I told them that tomorrow morning I can get a restraint order from Chief Justice uh, uh, Thakur's court in a pending case. So I don't need any paper. 
you just give me the you know uh, 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 a permission and we will do it i waited outside chief justice thakur's court from 10 15 in the morning for them to come back to me they never came back and they allowed him to go and now the same government says malia is run away oh come on now give me a break and it was reported in economic times it's not something that i'm telling you now in hindsight so i think everybody has his own wheels to grind i i am i i may sound cynical but let me tell you i have i have almost contempt for the systems in this country the systems are only there in place to harass innocent people systems are completely were overtaken by this kind of people and nothing can be done about them nothing mr kadel sir i john please uh, let's have mr kadel singh's opinion he's been the enforcement director see very interesting, very interesting question mr john has asked see the banking system if you look at the first stage is when a loan is granted collateral securities is taken Now the question is the and financial statements are submitted. Now very interestingly, the financial statements which are submitted to the bank and which are submitted to the income tax are different. We are not. We have started this system now. We were not asking that you you give us the same report or the bank take reports from the income tax. What is the financial statement they have submitted? Financial statements to companies registrar of companies is different. now when the collateral security is taken nobody examine it properly ah he is he is claiming it to be of rupees 100 crores it may be a it may be around 1 crore so the story becomes difficult thirdly the banking banks have a large number of the computer systems for example punjab national bank has 30 different computer systems and when this neeram modi case took place they were not connected with the core banking then how the money is taken out from the banks it is not taking cash it is through the shell companies now it is very interesting one bank core banking system is not connected with another bank core core banking system i had given a proposal that we should have a a query system in the reserve bank of india where where they can make a query about the movement of funds from one bank to another bank to third bank it is still not implemented there was a meeting with the rbi with the secretary of department of economic affairs directions were issued not being done the question is the accountability is not there if you have to please the system we have to improve the system there there has to be responsibility yes mr john Uh, sir my uh, i don't have the data but by my gut feeling i think if you take the overall percentage of frauds connived by public sector banks it will be at least 50 times what is connived by private banks because they have a board of directors to report to if corporate lending is not allowed from public sector banks and certain incentives are given to private sector banks for corporate lending how much how good will be the effect mr john let me tell you one thing before mr karnel singh responds to that take demonetization demonetization was a measure to fight uh, black money to unearth black money a single penny has not been found to be black money post demonetization why almost 15 to 16 lakh crore more than what was in official in circulation has been brought back into banking system every bank manager we know made money <clears throat> every bank manager people went with their cash illegal cash and deposited and the monies were shred by the banks within no time under guideline directions of the reserve bank of india so <laughs> these are all classic examples we we don't see what is happening it's all you know happening with you know we, openly it's all happening openly so don't worry i mean public sector banks nothing will happen to them they will continue to be what they are so if they are not allowed corporate lending 
let corporate lending be done only by the private sector banks. I am very sure the chairman of a private sector bank will think 50 times before sanctioning a loan, which is going to go bad. What you are suggesting responsible is that, for, for what the board of directors. We, we must denationalize the banks. Sorry for yes. uh, intervening. I am very much for it. Okay. Okay. Sorry, to how, how, how is the bank will earn? See, what, what is the source of earning of the banks? It is lending. And if you are saying they are not allowed to lend. No, he says that private sector banks should lend. See, mo most of the lending goes to the, see, the, the public sector banks, if they will not lend, how they will earn? <laughs> they will be closed down tomorrow. So we have to think about uh, this, such solutions may not be possible, what you are suggesting. And uh, Mr. Dushan Dave is right. What does it mean is uh, denationalize the banks. John, actually, the Yes Bank is also a private sector bank. Yeah, I was and about to say that. Because of lending. We have the case of Nana Kidwai, ICICI, again a private sector bank. So, uh, no bank is actually an exception, uh, public sector or, public, or uh, private sector. John, but what I see is that the real intent of the people and the moral values, we, this is, these are very, very motherhood statements or maybe terms which I'm using. But the fact remains that the core of the problem is that only in terms of we lack values, we lack the will, actually. So we have to see futuristically how do we transform this. <coughs> we make a roadmap to really see some silver lining, actually, to really curb corruption. Because oh, these are all very, very, I think, uh, very, very discouraging and very, very disappointing that we have to live with it as if. So what so are my we going fin to My final Im impression is that if the banks can't do it, individuals can definitely never do it. All right. Uh, now we have another question coming up from Roop Singh Kuntal. Good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Sipal Singh Ji and uh, Pawan Ji for uh, uh, putting this topic. This is a great topic which should be discussed among societies, not only with few people. But here, uh, I agree with Mr. Doshyan Dove that the honest people has to be uh, taken a task and they should be treated or seen differently. So I can give you one example. Uh, uh, I was uh, going to construct my house in Gurgaon. So this, this particular plot is near Jharsa Blaze. And you must know because you are from Delhi NCR, the, the story of Jharsa Blaze. So these people never allow you know, people to build a house or the government people also, you know, with them. So whatever I did, so I, you know, gather all the people who they have plot here and we make a society, <coughs> RWA. Now uh, we, we take an oath. In our society, we have, I think, 43 odd uh, uh, honors and we all decided not to bribe any government office, we have to fight together, any kind of thing. So small, small, uh, you know, decision we have taken. And today, police, uh, local authorities, they are seeing our pocket is a most disciplined pocket because we are not delaying uh, paying taxes to the government. We are not, we, we, we are law avoiding, uh, you know, citizen here. You can say it. And <laughs> after a gap of five years, again, they uh, uh, brought me as president of this uh, particular RDA, RWA. So here I have one suggestion. We are, I think, uh, 57 people or maybe 60 people here. We can, we can take oath. Now onwards, we have, to, we have to teach our children. We have to teach our friends. We have to teach our, uh, our neighbors. We have to suggest them. Do one thing every day, which clean, which can clean our society. So that kind of initiative we can start from now, from this particular forum. It will be a great thing. Otherwise, since 35 years, Mr. C. Pal Singh, Mr. Pawan knows me. I have attended thousands of uh, you know uh, seminars and that we have discussed. After coming out the seminars, we forget that what we have discussed. So each one has to take a task to take oath. I will do one thing, which is law-abiding kind of things every day. 
this is from my side i think uh, we can discuss uh, 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 30 days for same topic but conclusion is nothing so we have to come for the conclusion and we each one has to take note to do something to to clean our society thank you very much uh, thank you very much roop for the uh, comments that you made and now we running out of time i uh, giving it back to the president to sort of conclude the session थैंक यू पवन आलिया जी आफ्टर दिंटिलेटिंग डिस्कशन एंड लॉट ऑफ ब्रेन स्टॉम सेक्शन विच आई कैन नॉट एड मच बट कंप्लीट डिसअपॉइंटमेंट आल्सो इज नॉट द आंसर ऑफ कोर्स मिस्टर दवे पॉइंटेड आउट सब्सिक्वेंटली यस द मॉरल वैल्यूज हैव टू बी we again have to have those moral values which we had once for a time in our, all our religion terrorists yet we forget about it for petty gains so in any case i feel that we cannot at least turn a blind eye <laughs> if we do not use the eyes and ears to ex expose corruption at least let us turn a blind eye to the corruption let us make some headway some global initiatives were once listed and nobody could know better than mr dave that it was started with the world bank as to how to curb corruption it laid down certain parameters one was that the country the society should provide leadership to create international transparent standards that leadership will come only from people like mr dave or mr karna singh and i am very happy that, that i selected the two top most speakers who are not only speakers who have got those moral values behind them and who can definitely provide that sort of leadership to us secondly the world bank also laid down that in recognizing accountable efforts of the citizens when there is a honest reporting by citizens we have to do something to give them not only incentive but only to give them recognition also aside uh, there's another point which word back later third was to coordinate legal as well as administrative actions we have got both here available legal nobody can tell better than a very very frank forthright speaker like mr davan administrative colonel singh has been dealing with it so the coordination of legal and administrative actions may help us to make some dent in this direction then i think the lately the extensive use of technology to create tangible evidence may help to some extent to curb corruption or to check corruption in any case there are legal remedies i will not go into details but that legal remedies have a lot of lacunas for example the companies act of 2015 lays down for the auditors and the cast accountants mandatory that they will not allow any unaccounted money not to be exposed similarly there is also the act 201 of the of the uh, this uh, arbitration there also it lays down certain parameters then unfortunately the central vigilance commission initially has more of a directional rather than the advisory rather than direction you all know that as of know that cvc is mostly on advisory basis the directional basis are lacking so maybe certain legal lacunas which are there if we rectify we may be able to get it done i think 
I started with the eyes and ears. Of course, it has some effect. Me Too movement started some time back, though it had, it had gone down. I think Me Too in this case would be the people who have been affected by corruption, if they start getting together and exposing the corrupt people, it may help. But of course, it involves a lot of sacrifices. It involves a total mindset of an individual. I had the opportunity to work for long years with the very senior police officers of Maharashtra, who has since retired long back. He always used to tell us that you people have joined the police service, but here is the here is the cross, Christian, which I am carrying. Let us see how many of you follow this cross. And the cross means that in a year you might have to have about 20, 30 transfers in the police itself because you have not gone by the laid down orders or something like the orders given by some uh, uncouth and a, a person who is not himself accountable to anyone. So there is no doubt it's a very, very difficult process to have these ears and eyes. But I am very happy that we have had these discussions. Maybe we make some start somewhere. With these words, I'd like to thank once again both the speakers as well as the delegates who put very important and incisive questions. Let's hope that it at least turns us to a some extent. And we are out of so many people who are attending. One or two of us start having this. And probably in due course of time, we may be able to have that leadership or that movement where we are able to expose the corrupt people. With these words, I once again thank you all for having joined us in this webinar. And our next uh, banner, next, our next interactive session is the new Afghanistan government difficulties in buying peace by India. Now, this is a very uh, topical subject, and the speaker is Dr. Ajay Sani, who is an executive director of the Institute of Conflict Management. He has done a lot of research on terrorism as well as on insurgency. He is the speaker, and this interactive session, I'm sure, will, will be of great interest to people who are interested in the topical subjects today. This is on 25th February at 6 p.m. I request all of you to be with us and for your own benefit as well as for your own knowledge because this gentleman, I have spoken to him and learned a lot from him on terrorism and insurgency. Dr. Sani will be talking on this subject. With these words, I once again thank you for having encouraged us by your large presence today. Very big presence and number of countries have represented. Thank you very much, the learned speaker, that is Dr. Mr. Dave and Mr. Karnal Sikhi. Thank you so much. I am indeed thankful to both of you to have accepted our invitation, despite your reservation that nothing can be done. Because <laughs> I, I also subscribe to this view to some extent, but you have given us one idea that moral values probably may be able to be able to regenerate the moral values in our society and start having uh, thinking at least that some good day. Let the cross be taken by somebody and let us see who, who all of us follow that. Thank you very much for having me with us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Bhavanji. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dushan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kukal, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sipal, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Excellent session, sir. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you.